This is lesson three. We left off last night with the Levite and his wife, and we'll continue today with Judges 19.27. Judges 19.27. Before we begin our study, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you as a believer priest the privacy and the opportunity to restore harmonious rapport with God, if necessary. Therefore, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer so that you might utilize the SOP for the unique spiritual life of all human history. Let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to listen to the Word this morning. It is our privilege and opportunity to do so. And we ask that God the Holy Spirit will enlighten us so that these next few minutes we spend in worship of you, taking in the Word, might be a blessing and a challenge to us so that we can follow your protocol plan and grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We're continuing in Judges 19.27 where it states, and this is from the NASB version, When her Lord arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go on his way, then behold, his concubine was sprawled out, literally, in the Hebrew, at the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. We studied last night that this was the first time the Levite's wife recognized him as Lord. This was the first time and the last time she would ever be able to consider her husband Lord. And why was this? This is because through subjective thinking, through fulfilling her own lust, she was ne never able to recognize the fact that her husband was her authority and her obligation was to stay faithful to her husband. And as she enjoyed sexual relations with many men, it was sexual relations with many men that brought her to this point. For the brutish raping of this woman led to her death. We noted that if this event had not occurred, not only would she have continued to play the harlot, but she would have never recognized her husband as Lord. And therefore, God uses divine discipline as a source of enforced humility, so that just once, right before she died, she would recognize her husband as Lord. And this lady died in shame. She died a shameful death. And you might think this is unfair, but you cannot question God. God is absolutely fair. And her death can be described by 1 John 5.16b, where it states, There is a sin leading face to face with death. Therefore, we need to take some points regarding this. Point one, the sin faced face with death is the privilege of the believer who lives in carnality, perpetual carnality. Point two, there are three stages of punishment for those in prolonged carnality. Point three, first, there is warning punishment where the believer receives punishment as a wake-up call to rebound. Point four, then there is intensive discipline where God hits the believer right where it hurts so that the believer might wake up and rebound. Point five, if the believer lives in prolonged carnality, that believer will experience the sin face to face with death. That is the final discipline of the believer in Christ. And then the believer will be absent from the body and face to face with the Lord. The Levite's wife died the sin face to face with death. And for anyone who dies in such a way, shame and regret is related to such a life. The Levite's wife, as she was sprawled out, her hands stretched forth toward where her husband was sleeping, she died in regret and in shame. God gave her every chance to get with the word, for God is fair. But she was too occupied with the details of life. She was involved in subjective thinking. She was too busy in self-absorption, thinking about herself. And because of this, she moved into locked-in negative volition. And then God, knowing that she would never recover, was gracious and took her out of this world. And in death, she finally recognized just how wrong she was and how right God is. 
Look at Judges 19.28. And he, her husband, said to her, Get up and let us go. But there was no answer. She was dead. Then he placed her wife on the don his wife on the donkey, and the man arose and went to his home. Verse 29, When he entered his house, he took a knife and laid hold of his concubine and cut her into twelve pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout the territory of Israel. After the message last night, I was asked one question. Why was she cut into twelve pieces? Why did he cut his wife into twelve pieces? Over and over. <laughs> Which shows, number one, that you read ahead when I asked you not to, which is subjective thinking. And number two, that you did not get an answer, but you will now. So point one, subjective thinking is reading ahead when you're asked not to. <laughs> point two, subjective thinking is interrupting me when I accidentally named the wrong verse. I quoted the numbers of a verse last night that do not exist. But the verse does exist, and because of an interruption, I was unable to make a good point about dogs. So the correct verse is Judges 17.6, where it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. So the correction is Judges 17.6. So why was she cut into 12 pieces? Here's your answer. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel And he, Saul, took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and set them throughout the territory of Israel by the hand of messengers, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Then the dread of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out as one man. This event occurred before Saul went into reversionism. And when his nation was under attack from a foreign power, he became righteously indignant, and he sacrificed an oxen and sent it throughout the twelve tribes of Israel as a rallying cry, a rallying cry. It was a call to arms. You can read 1 Samuel 11 for details. So the reason why the Levite cut his wife into twelve pieces was to rally the people. And just imagine the shock of the people. This is no sacrifice of an animal or an ox, but rather this is human flesh of a woman being sent throughout the tribes of Israel. This was a rallying cry of a man who is now angry and bereaved. Notice the sudden change in the Levite. Suddenly he becomes angry, and he only becomes angry when he sees that his wife is dead. This is subjective thinking because he should have been angry when the homosexual gang wanted to rape him. He should have waited inside the house, and if they broke in, he should have gave them a fight of their life. But instead, he was gripped with fear the night before. Now he's gripped with anger. This man is in emotional revolt of the soul. This man is living by his emotions. One minute he's scared, the next minute he's angry, and he's trying to right all the wrongs of the nation of Israel. And by the way, these wide emotional swings from fear to anger and wide emotional swings from self-righteousness to self-pity result in the double-minded believer. Oftentimes, believers become manic-depressive or bipolar because their lives are ruled by emotion. Their lives are ruled by emotional swings, and this results in being double-minded. For example, look at the Levite. One minute there's no anger. In fact, he sleeps while his wife is being raped. And then only when his wife is dead does he react and become angry. Now he's a different person. The only conclusion can be that the Levite is moving toward the status of Daisukas, the psychotic believer. Let's continue with Judges 19.30. And it came about that all who saw it said, 
Nothing like this has ever happened or been seen from the day when the sons of Israel came out of Egypt unto this day. Consider it, take counsel, and speak up. So we here see that the emotional reaction of the Levite elicits a national emotional reaction. Suddenly, the people of Israel are shocked. How could this happen in Israel? Besides, it was the Levite, don't you remember, who would not sleep in a foreign country. He would have rather stayed with his countrymen. And when he did stay with his countrymen, they wanted to rape him and ended up raping his wife. So this is a wake-up call for Israel. Look, O Israel, look at the Israelite who wanted to stay within his own borders because it's unsafe in a foreign country. Now look what happened. He may have actually been safer by staying elsewhere. This was a real shock to all of Israel. The fact that his wife's body parts had been sent out to the twelve tribes. This became the gossip of the day. So what happens next is quite predictable. Since the Levite sent the remains of his wife to the twelve tribes as a call to arms, all of them had a meeting. This is where the Levite explains what happens, conveniently leaving out the fact that he himself had given his wife to the rapists. This is when all of the self-righteous in Israel, this is when all of the gossips in Israel got together and decided to have a meeting. Then, in all the emotional fervor, it was decided that they must confront the tribe of Benjamin and see why this evil, despicable thing happened in their country. As a result, the tribe of Benjamin sees this as an intrusion of the other tribes and nothing more as self-righteous arrogance. And therefore, they make a mistake by deciding to do nothing about the fact that a woman had been raped. They did not enforce the law when they should have enforced the law. But the tribe of Benjamin bowed their neck and decided to do nothing and basically told the other tribes to mind their own business. This is a perfect description of antinomianism versus legalism. The other 11 tribes had sins of their own to deal with, yet they jump on the tribe of Benjamin. When was the last time the other 11 tribes enforced the law concerning adultery? So the tribe of Benjamin bowed their neck and said, What right do they have to preach to us? So this results in a civil war, a civil war that starts out between legalism versus antinomianism. It might seem like a stretch, but it's far from it. First of all, let's go back to Romans 1.21, and we'll have a review of this and put it all into perspective. Romans 1.21 for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now this has to do with the unbeliever who reaches God consciousness. This is the unbeliever who looks toward the stars and suddenly realizes that there must be a God. Because God is evident in everything. And therefore, God consciousness for normal people is unavoidable. The believer, unbeliever, comes to God consciousness, but then he says to himself, I don't want to know God. And therefore, the unbeliever comes up with his own futile ideas. Look at verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Through their subjective thinking, the unbeliever professes to be wise because they believe that their earthly knowledge, their earthly genius, can not only fathom the works of God, but exceed the works of God. And therefore they relegate themselves to the same fate of Satan himself, who stated, I will make myself like the Most High God. That same fate is the lake of fire, and that's where every one of those unbelievers who value so highly their own intellectual futile ideas will end up. Romans 1.23 And exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of the birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. This is an image of the unbeliever who rejects God at God consciousness only to make gods out of idols. These are the same unbelievers today who attempt to humanize God by ascribing to God hu human sinful attributes, ignoring the absolute perfect attributes of God, the essence of God. Romans 1.24 Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their stream of consciousness to impurity that their bodies might be dishonored among them. Verse 25. 
For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. People in this country, believer and unbeliever alike, have humanized God. They have, in their subjective thinking, exchanged the truth of God for a lie. For if a person accepts the truth of God, then that person must reject their own arrogance. But many believers and unbelievers are too arrogant to realize that their ideas, their preconceived notions, are worthless when compared to the incorruptible truth of God. So therefore, the subjective thinker will not accept the truth of God and will rather believe the lie because of their own arrogance. Romans 1.26 For this reason, for what reason? For the reason of subjective arrogant thinking, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. So you see, it is the subjective thinking, the arrogant thinking of man that leads to homosexuality. You can see that people in subjective tr arrogance exchange the truth for a lie. This occurs through the function of the vacuum of the soul, as we noted last night. The vacuum of the soul called mataiotes in the Greek. It occurs when the unbeliever, for example, rejects God. The unbeliever comes to God consciousness and then says in his soul he does not want to know God. Therefore, there is a vacuum in the soul of such a person. For if they do not accept the truth, something must move into the stream of consciousness. Therefore, the lie floods the stream of consciousness because of the vacuum, the mataiotes, and sucks in every cosmic thought available. However, if a person is objective, humble, and eager to learn the truth, then the truth will fill that person's stream of consciousness. And such people will be classified as free, for the word of God states that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But you see here that people who reject the truth, therefore, have rejected freedom. And therefore they become a slave to their own passions, their own desires. And this results in a depraved mind. This results in an intensification of frustration, which eventuates in homosexuality. No one, therefore, as we noted last night, is born a homosexual. A person becomes a homosexual through consistent rejection of truth, which opens up the mataiotes, in which false doctrines flood the soul, and the truth is exchanged for a lie, and natural affections are exchanged for unnatural affections. I'm telling you all of this because I want you to make a connection. I want you to see that there is a battle between antinomianism which results in the things that we have just noted, and legalism, which will result in the things we are about to note. You see, the Apostle Paul is very methodical. He teaches us about the antinomian unbeliever and how his rejection of Christ leads to homosexuality and every depraved action one can think of. Now the Apostle Paul will contrast this in chapter 2 with the unbeliever whose idol is not a graven image, but rather, the idol of this unbeliever is the unbeliever himself, his own works, his own self-righteousness. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, you are without excuse, every man of you who passes judgment. For in that you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And when you and, when, and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. And do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment upon those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to a change of mind? But because of your stubbornness, that is, your subjectivity, and unchangeable heart, that is, locked in negative volition or blackout of the soul, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of a righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. What does it mean that he will render to every man according to his deeds? This is also found in Revelation 20.12. You can look that up later. And what does it mean to be judged according to your deeds? 
It doesn't mean that you're judged on the basis of being a good man or being a good little boy. Well, you actually are judged on doing that, but it doesn't mean you'll get to heaven by your good deeds. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We will see that at the moment we believe in Christ, we receive 39 irrevocable absolutes. And one of these absolutes is the righteousness of God. This is imputed to us at the moment of salvation. Therefore, since all of us at the moment of salvation receive the righteousness of God, none of us will be judged because, because we possess the righteousness of God. So, who is judged? The unbeliever is judged. And the unbeliever, interestingly enough, is not judged on the basis of his sin, but rather judged on the basis of his good deeds. All the good deeds in the world will never reach the righteousness of God, for God's righteousness is perfect. And imperfection, which is all the human race, can have nothing to do with a perfect righteousness of God, unless that righteousness is freely given to us. And it is, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So therefore, you can see from this that the self-righteous unbeliever is trying to reach God through his good deeds. But this is impossible, for Isaiah 64, 6 states, our righteous deeds are as menstrual rags. This is the corrected translation from the Hebrew. Our righteous deeds, therefore, are disgusting to God. So therefore, if the unbeliever's good deeds are judged, they are going to be judged as unacceptable menstrual rags, worthy of nothing but the lake of fire. So you see that the self-righteous unbeliever who judges the antinomian unbeliever who is involved in homosexuality, etc., receives the same judgment, the lake of fire. This battle between antinomianism and legalism is extended into the royal family of God as well. It was also a big issue during the time of Israel, especially during, during the time we're studying. So let's put all this into perspective and take a look at how this great battle is in fact a war between antinomianism and legalism. Turn back in your Bibles to Judges 20, verse 1. I'll read a good portion of what is going on and then explain it. Then all the sons of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, including the land of Gilead, came out, and the congregation assembled. And again, why did they assemble? They assembled because the Levites sliced his wife into twelve pieces, as we noted, and sent them throughout the land as a wake-up call, as it was custom to send the sacrifice of an ox throughout the land as a call to arms. And the congregation assembled as one man, just as they did in Samuel 11:7. They assembled as one man to the Lord at Mizpah. So what's happening now is historic. And all of this is now occurring because of the anger of one Levite who knew it would grab the attention of the all Israelites if he cut up his wife and sent her as a call to arms to all the tribes. This Levite was upset. Therefore, we can see the inner workings of what it is to be an emotional revolt. For one minute, this Levite is full of self-pity scared that the mobs will rape him and then the next minute he is full of self-righteousness completely outraged at the fact that these homosexuals had killed his wife while completely forgetting the fact that he gave his wife to these homosexuals this is therefore the perfect example of what happens in emotional revolt the constant oscillation between self-pity and self-righteousness so the Levite's self-righteous reaction and it was self-righteous riles up all the tribes of Israel. Now the tribe of Benjamin views all of this as an intrusion into their personal matters. They view it as 11 self-righteous tribes ganging up against their tribe. Therefore, they bow their neck and decide, wrongly so, to do nothing about the fact that they have disgusting criminals in their midst who would commit such vile acts. A similar situation happened in our country, for slavery is a social evil. The North, therefore, in their self-righteousness, wanted the South to get rid of their slaves. Yet many northern states practiced slavery as well and would not be exempt from it. Well, the Emancipation Proclamation, when Lincoln passed that, it was only to free slaves in the South, but there were still some slaves in the North. So the South viewed this as a self-righteous act. 
because the Yankees, some of them, were still practicing slavery. So the fact is there was no objective thinking on the part of the North or the South. The South, however, especially South Carolina, became hot-headed, arrogant, and pulled from the Union. Therefore, the Civil War began, and while the surface issue was slavery, it went much deeper than that. You see, the South looked at the North as a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites, trying to enforce their hypocritical laws on a free people. But you see, the South was wrong in having slaves, but they were too full of subjective thinking to see that. And the North was wrong in imposing rules on the South that they did not impose on themselves. But they could not see this was wrong because of their subjective thinking. So therefore, the Civil War. So in Israel, there is about to be a Civil War because those who want something done about these homosexuals are also being hypocritical. The view of the Benjamite is why do they wish to impose on us the law when they themselves have been living outside the law. The Benjamite, therefore, sees the hypocrisy of the legalist, but the legalist sees the disgusting act of dismissing these homosexual gangs without prosecution. So who is right in the situation? In the battle between the states, it is the North that turns out to be right. And why? Because they were right in principle. They were right when it comes to the fact that slavery is wrong, for slavery is wrong, and we have paid through the nose for being a slave-holding country up until this very day. So who is right in the situation between the Benjamites and the other 11 tribes? In the end, the other 11 tribes are right because they are right on principle that homosexuality must not be allowed to go rampant throughout Israel. They knew it would turn into a cancer if something wasn't done about it. It's interesting to note that the emotional revolt of the soul of the Levite results in a civil war. This shows how unstable Israel is at the time. And we must take a look at what happens and who ends up winning this war and why. For while on the surface it seems obvious that the eleven tribes should defeat the one tribe of Benjamin who was defending the homos, there is much more to this than that. Look at Judges 20:19. So the sons of Israel arose in the morning and camped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel arrayed for battle against them at Gibeah. Then the sons of Benjamin came out of Gibeah and fell to the ground. It means they killed 22,000 men of Israel in one day. Let's put this into perspective. The United States of America during the entire war against Iraq has lost less than 700 men. We went to war with Iraq with about 250,000 men and women, unfortunately. Women. I have to conclude, I have to include the women because they were sent into battle as well, but that's another story. So we went to war against Iraq and with 250,000. So after eight months of war, we've lost less than 700. And the people of Israel who fought against one tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, lost 22,000 men, not in eight months, but in one day. This Does this not say something? It definitely says something about the fourth estate, our media. They've managed to make this war against Iraq look like a failure. But in fact, this war against Iraq has been the greatest military conquest in nearly all of human history. Just imagine if we had lost 22,000 men the first day of battle as the 11 tribes of Israel lost going to war against the tribe of Benjamin. President Bush would have been impeached. Just note that you can't believe everything you see on the television. You have to put things into perspective. So what happened in this civil war is that the 11 tribes of Israel went against one tribe and they lost the first battle. And I'll tell you why in a moment. So after they lost the first battle, they didn't give up. In fact, they went before the Lord and they wept. Let's take a look, a look at verse 23. And the sons of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening and inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall we again draw near for battle against the sons of our brother Benjamin? And the Lord said, Go up against them. And Benjamin went out against them from Gibeah the second day and killed 18,000 troops of the sons of Israel. All these drew the sword. 
So again the eleven tribes of Israel lost the battle against the one tribe of Benjamin, the tribe that, of course, refused to prosecute the homosexual. So why is this? Why are the eleven tribes of Israel continuously losing battles against the one tribe of Benjamin when the tribe of Benjamin is harboring homosexual creeps? I'll tell you why. They are losing because God does not make a distinction between the sins of the immoral degenerate or the sins of the moral degenerate. God does not honor self-righteousness. You see, the eleven tribes of Israel going against the tribe of Benjamin are self-righteous. And the twelve tribes of Israel have been busy partying. All of them have forgotten doctrine. And there is not one tribe in Israel that is right with God. They have all been adjusting to people. That's why they've been losing this battle. So finally, someone within the eleven tribes had enough sense to tell them, hey, it's time to rebound. They must purify themselves before God will hear them and deliver them. So what they did, verse 26, Then all of the sons of Israel and the people went up and came to Bethel and wept. Thus they remained there, therefore, thus they remained therefore, and they fasted that day until evening. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So you see, the people of Israel had to go through a procedure. And the burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord was the Old Testament procedure of teaching rebound. Many had to be retaught rebound because they had forgotten through years of negative volition. So the offerings were made and the people rebounded. Then and only then did the eleven tribes finally achieve victory over the tribe of Benjamin. So you see, the importance of rebound cannot be overemphasized. The reason why so many had to die in a battle over a simple issue such as homosexuality, which had been solved by the Mosaic Law years before, was because of subjective thinking. It was because of the arrogance in the land where people for years refused to rebound and had to be retaught how to rebound. Therefore, the people of Israel, the eleven tribes, those who were believers, finally rebounded. And when they went into battle the third time against the Benjamites, only then were they absolutely victorious. And not only victorious, but they annihilated the city where this despicable, despicable act against the Levite had occurred. So in summary, you can see from Romans, and you can see right here from this book of Judges, that there is a natural conflict between both the self-righteous believer or unbeliever and the antinomian believer or unbeliever. However, both are wrong, both are out of line, and both receive punishment. You can see that it is the believer who follows the procedure of the protocol plan of God that receives the blessing just as the eleven tribes received the blessing of victory when they followed the protocol plan of God to rebound. You can also see the importance of rebound. It is, as we have studied, the first act of humility one will commit during his life as a believer. It should become clear, then, that it is necessary for us as believers in this client nation. We've just finished with the Levite. It was an overview. And I wish I could go into detail about the last battle between the eleven tribes and the tribe of Benjamin because it's quite interesting what happened, but you can read that on your own. When the Benjamite lost, he was shocked, and this is absolutely phenomenal. But I don't have a board to show you the battle scene, which is interesting. In the meantime, we'll continue in our study on subjective versus objective thinking. And since we don't have time to move on in our subject I might as well do an overview of what we've learned so far, and we have covered a lot of distance in a few hours of study. First of all, what we all need to realize is that there is a system that God has set up that must be adhered to, totally apart from our own preconceived notions. That system is delineated in the scripture, and it is made very perspicuous to all who care to learn. We noted that subjective thinking breaks from reality. It is impossible for a subjective thinker to think in terms of reality. We learned that everything a subjective thinker thinks 
is related to themselves. Some principles we can note regarding this is point one. A subjective thinker is hypersensitive when it comes to self, but insensitive when it comes to others. Point one, a subjective thinker is hypersensitive when it comes to self, but insensitive when it comes to others. Play poker. Point two, an objective thinker is not hypersensitive about himself and can be self-deprecating. In other words, an objective thinker can take a joke, even when the joke is on him. Point three, a subjective thinker only relates to authority when that authority agrees with their own preconceived notions. A subjective thinker only relates to authority when that authority agrees with their own preconceived notions. Point four, four. An objective thinker relates to authority whether or not the objective thinker agrees with that authority. In other words, an objective thinker will clean toilets if his boss asks him to, even if that's not in his job description. Point five. A subjective thinker will remain unemployed even if offered a job at McDonald's because a subjective thinker believes he is better than that. Point six. An objective thinker will take a job at McDonald's because an objective believer is humble enough to know that there is no shame in working at McDonald's. Therefore, an objective thinker quickly moves in the spiritual life into spiritual self-esteem where any existing inferiority complex is destroyed and self-esteem is not measured based upon what others think of you, but you rather base your own spiritual self-esteem on the basis of the perfect reflection of the mirror of the Word of God. Point seven, the objective thinker lives a tranquil life, while the subjective thinker lives in turmoil due to rejection of authority and utilization of the very same arrogance that Satan utilized in the prehistoric angelic conflict. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, it is our privilege, Heavenly Father, to feed upon your word. It is our privilege to study your word in a free country. Therefore, we come to you in thanksgiving. We pray tonight for our president, who is under more pressure than we can know. We know that our president is a believer, and we pray that you will give him wisdom, both him and his advisors, the wisdom to make the right decisions when it comes to war, economics, and all the other decisions he must make as president. We pray for our country. I know, Father, that we have been blessed as a nation, this land of milk and honey. We have survived the first major attack on our country since December 7th, 1941, over half a century ago. You've protected this nation and you've blessed this client nation. And no matter what happens in history, Father, at least we can take solace in the fact that while others may not follow your will and take in the word, we can say, as Joshua said, I know not what course others may take, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We pray that you will take the things that we have noted tonight and make them a, or today and make them a source of blessing and challenge to us. May we understand the difference between antinomianism and legalism, and may we realize through the means of God the Holy Spirit that antinomianism and legalism are both outside the Word of God and that the only way to live the Christian way of life is to learn the protocol plan of God and that the first step, the key to the entire spiritual life, is the first act of humility that every Christian must make in order to grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that is to utilize 1 John 1.9. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.